In our fifth story, we talk to Terry McMahon, the acclaimed writer and director of the brilliant new dark Irish film, Charlie Casanova. And Ruth McIntyre, who plays the wife Saoirse of the unforgettable Charlie. As the film tagline says, you don't know him, but he already hates you. I'll tell you what, Kevin, while Donald's trying to resuscitate his choking wife, we'll draw for it. For what? To go to the shops. Draw five or below, I win. Six or above, you win. Okay, well, what about putting a bet in it? 20. Oh, I've met my husband the big spender. 50. Why not make it a clean 100? That's fighting talk, Charlie. A bit too manly for my Kevin, don't you think? Why don't we make it two? <laughs> Kevin, are you growing a pair of balls in front of our very eyes? Why don't we make it five? Charlie's hot. Oh, no. Tell him about as many ways we can pack this. I don't want to bet 500. Chicken shit. I want to bet a thousand. Charlie, stop this bet now, please. Now, let the fool bet our daughter's college fund. Kevin, I hope your underwear is stretching to accommodate those newfound testes of yours, a clean thousand it is. So, that was the first glimpse of Charlie Casanova. Terry and Ruth, thank you for joining me. Hello. Terry, you have a bit of a cold there, have you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, I watched that film. It's not, it's not out yet, obviously. But it's struck me as one of the finest films that I actually have seen. And I'm not just saying that because you're staring at me. <laughs> the fact is that the portrayal of that Celtic Tiger cub, Charlie um, Barnum, um, is so powerful. And what happens to him and ha in, in the course of a weekend at a, a Midlands Hotel or two weekends at Midlands Hotel and his wife and, and his friends is a very powerful, perhaps you said earlier, dark commentary on ourselves, I suppose, and how we behaved through the Celtic Tiger years and obviously perhaps since then as well. The performance of Emmett Scan in particular in the central role was quite, was, was Oscar winning if, if it could be. It was, it was that strong. What you said also you couldn't categorise or it's, it's the film can't be categorised or won't be categorised by, um, I suppose, too many people here. What's, what, what is Charlie Casanova about and how would you define it? Uh, in terms of categorisation, the problem is when distributors look at a film, they look at its genre. And Charlie doesn't really have a genre. I see it as a dark satire, but it's not really a genre you can sell. So automatically it might prove <coughs> problematic in terms of reaching an audience. But the basic simple story is that there are six people who go to a hotel for a weekend for a conference. And uh, they're arrogant, they learn how to finish each other's sentences, they live in this small little microcosm. You set back, but maybe the Heiser Celtic Tiger you set back at that time? Uh, no, it was, well, it was, it, it was unintentionally a dark prophecy because there was none of the recession, none of the collapse, none of the things that we, we are all so knowledgeable about now. But it was never intended to be a commentary on anything. It was just supposed to be trying to explore these characters and trying to explore how prejudice can creep up on us and how we can justify the ugliest possible behaviour as long as we can negate responsibility. And that's what's happened in our culture. So it's fascinating that we tapped into that in the film. But on the simplest level, this guy knocks his middle class, or he's a middle class aspirant, he knocks a girl down, a working class girl down. And uh, he uses a, a deck of cards to decide whether or not he should stay and report the accident and hopefully save her life. That's, sorry, that's, that's, the, that's the key thing that runs throughout the film, how he, yeah. he relies on, his, on the cards to tell him what, it's, what to it's do. It's a very simple thing that uh, Ace to five is yes, six to ten is no. So he picks a t ten and it allows him to justify driving away from the girl. From that point onwards, he is on a ticking clock because everything that he does, everything he can wish to do, can be answered through the cards. But of course, as soon as you pose the question in a way that satisfies you, you can justify all kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's how he tries to negate full responsibility and blame effectively the entire working class for what has happened to him and his friends. And it's about the taboos that go on behind an apparently normal domestic world of these six people and the poisons that truly exist there. What, what kind of drove you to make this film? What was the intention when you started writing it in the first place? You said it wasn't meant to be a commentary or a prophecy. Mm. Uh, it's funny, there's two things. I remember, I think it's the Annabelle nightclub. There was a kid who was killed there and he was killed by uh, five or six middle class kids or upper class kids and it was a fight, it was violence, it was all those things that can happen in any context. But what made this different was how all these kids' fathers, with the exception of one, were able to wield extraordinary power and remove their children from culpability. And the one guy who didn't have a powerful father was hung out to dry. 
Now, the kid who was killed, that's a dreadful tragedy. Let's not even discuss that in any context other than tragedy. But what I found most interesting was the idea of culpability being removed if you have power. And then a very similar time frame, there was a fella in Grafton Street, again, working class kid, worked as a porter in the library. And uh, two, and the, again, the way the, it was described in the media, two tennis players from Sutton beat the shit out of him, beat him to within an inch of his life. And when it came to court, again, the powerful sway of their fathers allowed this guy to be essentially bought off. Apparently now he has major problems on multiple levels, but he's forgotten. And I was always fascinated by the idea that uh, we exist in a two-tier system. It's not necessarily even class, it's just those who have power and those who don't. And how since the recession has happened in this country, we have attacked the poor, the vulnerable, the working class. We've demonized them and set them up as the fall guys. And I was obsessed with finding a way to explore that idea of what a man will do to convince himself that he's okay, as long as everyone else is feeling the pain. And I think now it's become a, a greater zeitgeist issue in our own culture. And just getting that the, because um, interesting that the character of Charlie who represents, but also you have, uh, I bring Ruth in here, you have the other characters who are as complicit mm. in, in the behavior, because it's not just um, Charlie and his own, everyone to some greater or lesser extent is, is complicit as it with Charlie in those that you may think may actually know that he covered up, for example, the, the knocking down the, 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 um, the woman. Mm. Um, but the interesting the other characters, and Ruth, you, you, you played Saoirse, yeah. Charlie, Charlie's uh, wife. That's right. Um, I think we actually have a clip of you, it's towards the, the last range of the film, mm. and uh, he has, I suppose, done, not to give the game away, but he's done quite a bit at this point, and you can actually see he's quite uh, beaten up. <laughs> so um, we might go to that clip and have a look. Great. Work out, super fit, fully fed, masters of the universe, and what do we do? We bend over for these bad, dying, thieving, gypsy, working class low lives and let them fuck us. You have to stop talking like this. Many a true words have been said in jest, many a true teller has been accused of bigotry. I'm working no, class, Charlie, and your parents were born in Kula. And But my parents were blind, and I could see, would you claim I was blind? Middle class is a state of mind, not a place of birth. Surely money taught you that, you sure as shit spend enough of it. <laughs> Put the red number on, I got you, will you? Can you have an erection at this time? Effect you have on me, baby. You and me against the world, right, baby. Right. Having a Costello. I'm pregnant, Charlie. Did my wife just crack a footy? Yeah, I tricked you into getting me pregnant. How's that for comedy? All's fair in love and rape. Powerful stuff, uh, Ruth. That was interesting because obviously you had a lot of things um, happening there. There's obviously mm. the very uh, fact that you know this guy. Or do, do you know? I mean, that's the question. Do you do you know this Charlie? I mean, what it says you set up there yourself. You were working class, but you have been elevated, if you like, to um, a better life. I mean, a good life. You obviously you mm. have money. Is there some sense that you've, um, I suppose, um, abdicated your, I suppose, connection to? your working class roots and allow Charlie to do what he, Charlie does? Yeah, I mean, uh, to some degree, Saoirse enjoys the privileges she gets from Charlie being successful and having money. Um, but she really does love Charlie as well. And um, she, he excites her. Clearly not in the bedroom, as you'll find out in the movie. <laughs> but he, he does really excite her. She gets a lot from him too. What did you get? From, what is it that she gets from him? I mean, this guy, mm. um, as we, we talked about, as, as in the film, is in many respects um, somebody who, at first glance, mm. you would hate. I mean, he, he's. Um, we we'll, we'll see a short clip of him coming up mm. about what he actually thinks of working class people, but not just that. I mean, he's very cold. He's almost psychopathic in in his actions. Um, what is it about him that excites? The this is at a point where Charlie is going through his demise. Um, the relationship with Saoirse has been through so much excitement, a lot of great times and money and flamboyance. He's very charismatic. Very he? charismatic. His energy, his, 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 he just oozes masculinity. Um, and all of these things are a huge draw for Saoirse. I fell in love with Emmett 
filming this film. So, you know, it, 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 you, you can't escape it. There is a draw to it. There is a greed that every person has as well. And until you can't have what you want, you will just continue to, to want and want and want and take and take and take until it gets to a point where you're stopped. Search is no different. When I read this script, um, I looked at Search and I actually rang Terry and I said, Search is the normal one. You know, when you read the script, and everybody says that when they when they look at it, Search is the normal one. But I mean, but do you think? <laughs> I mean, but you were the support to Charlie. I mean, this is the thing. And again, absolutely, go, go there back is to, a balance there. We're going back to the friends that we mentioned before. Is quite a number of them mm. that without this circle of friends that he had around him, he couldn't be able to be himself. He wouldn't be able to be the person. So the. I mean, it's all very well denigrating a, a character like Charlie, and, and I, as I get to it, in fact, as, the, as it goes on, I found myself actually, in the very beginning, being very turned off by him, and then... There's a certain part of you that wants to absolutely be Absolutely, like and him, I felt though. that actually I became, I think as you put the phrase, <laughs> shoulder to shoulder with him. I actually found myself agreeing with him and almost liking him, and then, then it being repulsed by myself for actually liking what it was that. So that's, mm. it was a very, it's been a very clever way of um, portraying something he says the things that you actually believe and then realize you get sucked into um, this very ab apparent creature who's very cold and calculating and to be honest with you wouldn't, as it turns out, you wouldn't feel safe for turning your back on him, um, who abdicates his own responsibility through a deck of cards um, or chooses to, I suppose, abdicate responsibility that way. It's just, I find myself that without Searsha or other people mm -hmm. around him, he wouldn't have been um, the character perhaps that he ended up to be, would he? I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, some people have those thoughts. And yes, some people are excited by Charlie and the character that he is because maybe somewhere, somewhere along the line, you do have those thoughts. But it's the step to actually take that action and do it. That's something completely different. Does she know, does she know Charlie has... She's worried. Um, she's concerned that... Um, I mean, we're not giving away that she's pregnant there. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, she knows there's something wrong and like a lot of women, a lot of women you feel that in some way you can fix it and in some way you a child may you can, help. You can, you can change the man, is it? Not change the man, but fix the problem. It's not that you want to change the person, but you know there's something not quite right, but you don't want to give up on it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe a child will help. I mean, how many women do you know that think that that's the way uh, forward, personally speaking, no, I don't. <laughs> well, I know, but not I know not give me the women. Way. I think most people would know somebody who has tried to fix a relationship by having a child mm -hmm. or hoping that the dynamic will help. Mm -hmm. To know? go back to um, you, sorry, um, before I play the, the, the other clip, in your, you've, you run acting classes that um, regularly in Dublin. Uh, I was on, lucky enough to be on them myself, and we heard earlier from Vivian Connolly, who was inspired by her class with you um, and in your class you, you do absolutely have a mantra it was when you're you're, you're getting I suppose actors and directors and, and writers to understand what it is to be um, connecting with an audience you say what what you always should ask yourself the question what the audience see thinks and feels what do you think the the audience watching this film um, considering that it's, it's something that Andrew hasn't seen before uh, and should see definitely what what is it you want them to see think and feel well at the risk of sounding preachy obviously you're making a film hoping that they will bring their own 10 percent to it they will complete it and make it personal for themselves but on the simplest level is what do you want your audience to see think and feel and i'd love them to see beyond the mask see beyond the bullshit, beyond the political lies i'd love them to think of what they can do about that and of them to feel rage enough to take action. Mm -hmm. Simplest level, it's, it's, no one's naive enough to think that cinema can have any real sway, but you're looking for the seeds of some kind of fucking revolution, because Lord knows we're at that stage now where it's a, a bomb in a suitcase kind of politics, mm -hmm. and there seems to be no other avenue. So you're looking to agitate at least a, a desire for self-awareness, mm -hmm. and that individual awareness becomes collective. I, just before we play the, actually we'll, we'll play the next clip and I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a question afterwards on it. I love that uninhibited working class laughter. You are wonderful, one and all. Everybody wants to be working class these days. A badge of honour, but what is it with you and tracksuits? 
that was designed for healthy living, worn by the unhealthiest members of society. Only time you come first is the rest of the Tabula Welfare queue. <laughs> Look at that. The self-appointed moral leaders booing. Now don't you be defending them, they are well able to look after themselves, aren't you girls? I mean, we all know the jokes. How do you know when a working class chick has an orgasm, she drops her chips, why do young working class men grow moustaches, feel more like their mothers? But I love the working class, I really do.